thanks for the opportunity to talk about uh, uh, urinary cells. Uh, to, to warn you front up, um, to, to circle the, the, the task I've been given, I'm not going to only talk about the CKD, but also touch on more acute settings which overlap with uh, um, CKD. We have been working on this for the last uh, um, 15 years, and then those are my disclosures. We have filed two patents on the way. And I understand we are a somewhat diverse audience, so I'm going to start off with just framing the, the uh, clinical problem to have everyone on board. And to frame the clinical problem, I brought you Claris, and Claris has, has his kidney disease, and the doctor is noting that their kidneys are getting worse. And what we usually would now do is, is a renal biopsy to, to find out what's really, going off, of, what's really going on. Of course, that's not good news, but it gets, for many diseases, even worse that uh, those diseases that we can treat oftentimes means balancing risk, and there's a risk of side effects like gaining weight or risk of infection, and there's a risk of, of, of treatment failure. And of course, this leaves Claris with, with questions, and one question is, do we really always need a renal biopsy? And maybe more importantly, why is there no fine-tuning of the, of the treatment so that every patient just receives as much treatment as needed and personalized to his needs? And what she's asking, in essence, is why is there no re reliable biomarker? And be, 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 before we talk about biomarkers, maybe we should quickly re, re reflect on how we're doing our di diagnostics right now. And if we're honest with, with ourselves, not, not really much has, has changed over the last 20, 30, 40 years. We're still looking mainly at, at three things. We look at the GFR, which is creatinine or acetatin. We look at the intactness of the blood urine barrier, which is proteinuria. And we look at cells in the urine, which is a, in, it's a sediment. And I think nephrology has one big advantage, is that we get our, our cells from for free. While oncology has to do surgery or biopsy to get cells, we just get them in, in the urine. And we already use that right now, which is helpful. But I think in, 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 in 2022, just looking at unstained cells under the microscope might be an underperformance. So our prediction is, that the cell composition in the urine is the perfect window into the kidney. So if we have elements from pathology like inflammation, damage, from fibrosis repair, that we can find and monitor all these things if we look at cells in the urine looking, uh, using modern tech techniques. And I'm going to try to con convince you of this by talking about T cells and kidney tubular ep epithelial cells. And if, we are, if you're still doubting whether this is worthwhile, we at, uh, as we all are in Berlin, we have to give some credit to um, Rudolf Virchow, which is one of the most famous uh, Berlin-based doctors, and he was a founder of, founder of the concept of cellular pathology, which in, in essence says diseases are, are made of cells. So maybe if you look at cells, this would bring us further. So I'm going to first talk about T cells as a marker for in, in, inflammation. And maybe it's good to start off doing that by using a very inflammatory renal disease as an example to get started. So this is what we did, and we first um, have started doing this by looking at patients with lupus and, and nephritis. And we just looked at a cohort of patients with lupus, and, and here you see the amount of T cells in the urine, here the disease, uh, the, the disease activity is given as a score, and then the letter, and as a rough estimate, a letter of more than 10 is an active lupus. And now the black button dots are patients with past or present renal involvement. If there's no disease activity, there's no T cells, once they get active, they have T cells in the urine. The boxes are patients without renal involvement, so regardless of disease activity, there's no T cells in the urine. And if you compare this to the gold standard, which is obviously the, the, the kidney biopsy, you see that all patients with proliferative lupus nephritis or, nephritis, or if you want inflammatory nephritis, have elevated T cells when the others don't. So, and this gave us a fantastic biomarker performance and a black and white answer whether a given patient has active inflammation in the kidney. We also compared this to, to, to other biomarkers. And in lupus, there are a couple of chemokines being advocated as, as, as novel, novel biomarkers. And importantly, the, the T cells uh, out, outperformed the classical biomarkers we use in the clinic right now, like proteinuria and creatinine, and also novel biomarkers like the chemokine and the MCP1. You can also use this in the follow-up and look whether patients with active lupus respond to an induction treatment. If you do that, you see two groups. One group of patients which normalizes their cells pretty quickly, and one group of patients which has persistent of cells or even increasing amounts, and the normalizers respond with lowering with, of the disease activity under induction treatment, while the non-normalizers don't, and the normalizers also have a better creatinine in increment uh, during induction treatment. 
Of course, counting T cells sounds great, but maybe we can even do even more if we look further in the, into the phenotype. So we did a, did a broader analysis of the, of the immune cells in blood and urine. And uh, kind of as expected, the cells in the urine are mostly of the effect of memory phenotype. Those are the cells in the blood and those are the, in, the, in, in the urine, which, which kind of makes sense. This is an active inflammation. No, but if you look, there are some patients with very high frequencies of effect of memory and some that are rather low. And we compared this to the outcome. And the, and the measurement was made at the time of doing the, uh, the diagnosis, we could see those with lower amounts of effective memory T cells all achieved a complete response six months later, while those with high amounts didn't. So this could help us pre predict the outcome. This is at present just exploratory data, but we are currently running a prospective trial to um, confirm this. Uh, what about other inflammatory re renal diseases? We have done this in lupus and anchor vasculitis and renal transplant re re rejection. In lupus, there's three independent cohorts by us and others. It's always a fan fantastic biomarker per performance. Similar in anchor, two independent cohorts also been doing very well. In renal transplant rejection, two cohorts, not quite as well, but as a biomarker, still a very good performance with an area under the rock curve of 0.9 and 0.88. And importantly, in all settings, the T cells outperformed our classical biomarkers like proteinuria, creatinine, and sediment, and also novel biomarkers like MCP1 and uh, soluble uh, CD163. Now, if you looked have closely, you might have noted the, uh, the following thing, that there are some patients with inactive disease which have mildly elevated T cells. Now, what, what might, might, might that mean? And we speculated whether this may put them at risk for a future we relapse, and we first looked at this retrospectively at all the inactive patients that we analyzed over the last years, and saw all patients which later on suffered a relapse had elevated T cells. Not everyone with elevated T cells did, but these are identified patients at risk, and this is when the relapses happened. This, of course, is just retrospective data. So we recently uh, designed a prospective trial on this in two, ho two hospitals and three anchor clinics and included 112 anchor patients with inactive disease, had to exclude 10 patients in the end, analyzed 102, of which 10 <coughs> suffered a renal relapse in the subsequent uh, six months and 90, 90 state and stable remission. And what we saw, those who subsequently relapsed had higher T cells, while those who, um, compared to those who stayed in stable remission. And if we again compare this to other biomarkers which are advocated to predict relapses like proteinuria, sediment, anchatitis, the T cells again outperform the other markers. And this is the, the relapse free and survival, if you want. Those are the ones with elevated T cells and they have a significant risk of, uh, of, of relapse when those don't. Okay, so much about, about T cells, but obviously most of us are interested in, t uh, in the kidney, so we also try to establish a, um, a marker panel to, to um, assess kidney tubal epithelial cells in the kidney. And this is our, our staining panel. We stain for cytokeratin and a couple of markers. This is how the cells look like if you sort them out, and they indeed look like tubal epithelial cells. You can even do electron my microscopy on them and see that most of these cells are dead, some are, some are living. And importantly, this, the staining panel does not stain cells from the lower urogenital or, or tract, so it's spe uh, specific for kidney cells. And we analyzed this first, whether this is a damage mark of a tubular damage in two cohorts of patients with AKI. This is our discovery cohort, this is our um, um, validation cohort, and both cohorts with increasing stages of AKI, you get more tubular, uh, tubular ep epithelial cells, which predicted the speed of re re recovery. If you had higher tubular epithelial cells, you took longer to, to recover, and it also predicted the length of, 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 of hospital stay. Uh, one current uh, limitation might be what we frequently hear. Well, most of these studies have been done with fresh samples, and this, this of course, will, will never be in, um, implemented in, in, in a broad setting because it limits applicability to big hospitals, makes impede scalability, makes a test expensive. So we developed uh, uh, an easy-to-use storage protocol where all you have to do is put a urine sample in a cup and close it. You can put it in the fridge, and then you can uh, measure the cells anytime in the next uh, six days or. or 
of, of, of freezer cells, and this protocol is freely available. So this brings me to my first summary, that urinary T cells identify patients with active renal inflammation. I think this is a feature that we can monitor very good. And this uh, could help us uh, monitor treatment response and predict outcome. At least in anchor vasculitis, it uh, helps us predict future flares. And we also have urinary kidney epithelial cells, which reflect the extent of, of ongoing tubular damage. And an easy-to-use sample cup is available to simplify lo the lo logistics. So this was all data on, on floor size and cytometry. But, but what, what could we do or see if we knew even more about these cells? And obviously, the, the best uh, technique, if you want to do a deep phenotyping nowadays, is single cell uh, sequencing of, of cells. And we, we um, set up a single cell sequencing pipeline and analyzed uh, 32 patients with AKI, 40 fresh uh, urine samples, pre-sorted them with flow cytometry and did single cell uh, sequencing. And this is one of my favorite slides at, at the moment because it for the first time shows us which cells are in the urine in, in AKI. Most of you are probably uh, accustomed to, to looking at these UMAPs and TISNIs and what it says, each colored cloud is one kind of cell. And we have podocytes in the urine. I was, I was actually doubting that, but there's podocytes in the urine. Then there's a large, a large population of, of tubular epithelial cells. There's immune sites like monocytes, monocytes macrophages, there's T cells, and there are some kind of contaminating urogenital uro cells. And if we just look at the tubular epithelial cells, we find some clusters of pretty healthy, normal-looking kidney cells. And this is color-coded. We find cells from the glomerulum, from the proximal tubulus, from the distal tubulus, and from the con collecting duct. But the major part of the tubular epithelial cells in the urine is altered. They show features of inflammation and tissue rearrangement. Those just look damaged and frankly dying. There's a small island of proliferating cells, and these cells down here, at least if we compare their, their gene expression to, to other data sets, it looks like stem cell-like cells, and they are features of cells of re regeneration. And one question that we, that we always get, this is interesting, but how similar are the cells in the urine to the cells in the kidney? And to answer this, we've, uh, we've compared the cells from the urine to, uh, to kidney biopsies. Those were post-mortal kidney biopsies from AKI patients. So it's, it's, it's not the same patient, patients, but it's the same disease. And you can see the respective cell types, like podocytes, here's the tubular epithelial cells and immune cells, they correlate quite well. Not perfectly, but, but very closely, the phenotype in the urine to the phenotype in, in the kidney. However, if you look at, at urine, there's two biases. Now, this is the biopsy data, this is the urine data. First, if you look at where are the cells coming from? In the, in the biopsy, you find lots of proximal tubular epithelial cells, loop of handler cells, and some collecting duct cells. The urine also has proximal epithelial cells, but it's enriched for cells coming from the distal segment. And also, if you look at the, at the cell state and just roughly divide it in healthy and injured, you see in the biopsy, there's lots of healthy-looking cells and some injured. In urine, we also find healthy-looking cells, but most cells are injured. So urine is biased in two ways, by the cell origin and by the cell state. And of course, we would like to use this as a di uh, di diagnostic uh, tool. And so, to, as a proof of principle, try to answer the question whether we can, could use this in the future to make differential di uh, diagnosis, we grouped our AKI patients in different etiologies, cardiogenic, septic, prerenal, and compared this to publicly available data sets like diabetic nephropathy and FHGS. And you see that the clusters look, 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 look different. So I think this is very promising that we can use this in the, in the future to tell which kidney disease a patient might, might have. So this is my, my second summary. Single cell sequencing in urine is feasible. Urine cells uh, contain unaltered as well as, as altered cells. And it's rich for cells of distant origin as well as altered damaged cells. And we might use this, uh, may be able to use this to differentiate different disease entities. And how could, we, could all this be used now and in the future? I think urinary flow cytometry is pretty close to being applicable in, in the clinic. I think we can use it to monitor the 
the you know, inflammatory disease or the inflammatory component of, of diseases and guide treatment. We can monitor tubular damage. I think this will not be an, uh, an, 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 a substitute for, often for biopsy, except maybe in selected cases where we don't want to biopsy anyway, that we will be able to exclude active inflammation. Single cell sequencing, this is music of the, of the future, but maybe we'll be able to substitute biopsy in uh, selected cases. And also this will give us the opportunity to identify driving pattern and mechanisms for individualized treatment. Thank you.